In this segment, we'll talk about evaluating and selecting alternatives. There are a number of methods that are highly useful in early life cycle where you don't have a lot of information, and they're good for simpler decisions, such as selecting a preferred supplier for a part. There are three commonly used approaches here. One is an unweighted matrix or a pew matrix. Second is the analytic hierarchy process, which involves pairwise comparison. And third is a weighted matrix. Decision matrix methods are highly useful in their multiple forms that are used in practice. They're simple, intuitive methods to use, and you can use them with audiences of varying technical backgrounds. They can be used by an individual, but they're perhaps most useful with small teams. They're well suited to early discussions where you want to narrow the range of the concepts. And it's important to remember these are relative trade-offs and they're not easily transformed to absolute trades, but they do help you build your knowledge. So let's talk about an unweighted decision matrix. It's important to remember that you must choose your evaluation criteria and then generate your alternatives as a first step. Then you form a matrix and identify a baseline concept. You should use your current system as the baseline if that exists, and if not, you can choose one of the other concepts to be your baseline. You want to evaluate your concepts against the criteria and then generate ratings. And these ratings are really tallying up what's better, what's the same, and what's the worst for each one of your concepts. You can then discuss the results and implications as a team, or if you're doing this individually, be sure to engage some peer review. In the graphic, you'll see an example of an unweighted matrix. Along the left side, you'll see the set of criteria that you're going to be evaluating your options with. In the gray shaded column, you'll have your baseline concept, and you can see all of your options on that top row. This is a case where we're looking at replacing our current lawnmower with a new option. In the bottom half of the matrix, you'll see that we're going to tally our better, same, and worse scoring for each one of the options. In this matrix that's already been scored, take a look at the hand mower and the hybrid mower. You can see that the hand mower has six things that get better, none that stay the same, and two that get worse. For the hybrid mower, you see three things get better, four stay the same, and only one gets worse. So which one would you pick? It's not a simple answer, and you really need to have more dialogue to get to a preferred solution. You can also use matrices to look at what individual stakeholders want. First up, elicit your most important criteria by interviewing a diverse set of stakeholders. Then, when you choose one of your stakeholders to talk with, you can find out what their most important attributes are. Run the matrix with their preferred attributes and then discuss it with that stakeholder. You can then use multiple matrices for stakeholder negotiations where each stakeholder could take a look at what's important to their peer stakeholders. If you take a look at this example, you'll see that the hand mower and the robotic mower have scored the same. The question is, why is that? You cannot make a decision by simply looking at what each of the options scored. You have to talk more with the stakeholders to find out why those preferences tally up as they are. Weighted decision matrices are useful when there are a lot of entangled criteria or when you have a lot of varied stakeholder priorities. The way to approach this is basically the same, but you also have to decide on a weighting method. You then weight your criteria based on the best available information that you have which you've elicited from the stakeholders wherever possible. And then you score the concepts using your ratings and your weights. So what is a decision matrix method for? It's really about structuring and representing an evaluation procedure. It gives you the discipline and the structure that you need to make decisions. It serves as a common visual boundary object for discussions, and it helps to encourage teamwork. A decision matrix can help you converge on options by eliminating the weaker ideas and retaining the stronger ones. It also can help you with divergence in the fact that it can help identify opportunities where you might possibly want to combine things into a new alternative. So what is a decision matrix not for? Well, it's not for automatic decision making. The scores or these numbers are for guidance only and they shouldn't be summed up algebraically, although we see plenty of instances where people do that in practice. It's not for performing trade studies or for trade space exploration, as we'll understand as we get more into the course. 
So what are some good practices for evaluation methods? Well, we want to understand any constraints and biases at the start. We want to decide and agree on the criteria before we identify the concepts. And importantly, recognize that we're making qualitative comparisons. And where you're using a team, have the team members do their own rating and then discuss these and derive a team result. And finally, we need to recognize the limitations of these numeric comparisons that we're seeing. Remember that we're using relative weights that are based on qualitative judgment. And you should consider profiles and not really summing up things. You want to be cognizant of the scales that were used and only do appropriate operations and statistics given your scales. There's a lot of pressure to arrive on a recommended choice, and you need this to emerge from your discussions and not consider it to be a turn the crank process. Finally, sometimes the answer out of running a decision matrix is further study is required.